Without further ado, let me just tell you a little bit about Mr. Jeremy Skihill. Mr. Skihill is a Puffin Writing Fellow at the Nation Institute and a frequent contributor to the Nation magazine. He's won numerous awards, including the prestigious George Polk Award. While a correspondent for the national radio and television show Democracy Now!, Mr. Skihill reported extensively from Iraq through both the Clinton and Bush administrations. Traveling around the hurricane zone in the wake of Katrina, Jeremy exposed the presence of Blackwater mercenaries in New Orleans and his reporting sparked a congressional inquiry and an internal Department of Homeland investigation. He was among the only Western reporters to gain access to Abu Ghraib prison when Saddam Hussein was in power, and his story on the emptying of that prison won a golden reel for the best national radio news story of 2002. And as, if you've watched Democracy Now!, he's also been a producer and has, and has been on the air and, uh, with Amy Goodman for a number of years. And he, he lives in the New York area. He's from Milwaukee, so he's not far away from in terms of a uh, local boy. So we, we'd like to give a round, warm welcome of applause for Mr. Jeremy Scahill. Well, thank you very much for uh, coming out today. It's a, it's a really nice day, and it's nice to see so many of you willing to sit in a, well, a soccer stadium. <laughs> Interesting venue. Uh, you know, I've been, I've been asked a number of times uh, since it, it went up uh, that, I, that I was going to be coming to Holland, Michigan. You know, aren't you nervous about going to Holland, Michigan? Uh, not at all. I mean, I, 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 I think that what we need more of in this country is vibrant dialogue and debate. And uh, I, I come here in the spirit of that dialogue and debate. Uh, and I, I would welcome, if there are folks among you who don't like what I've done or don't like the kind of journalist I am or you know, don't agree with what you've read in my book, I would love to sit down and talk with you about it. I also want to say at the, at the onset here that I want to thank the folks that invited me here, but I, I, I feel like I need to say I'm, I'm neither a Democrat nor a Republican. Uh, I'm a journalist, and I don't intend on becoming a Democrat anytime soon. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I've, I've uh, over the past decade of being a journalist, um, I've hammered away on the policies of the Clinton administration, of Democratic-controlled Congress, of Republican-controlled Congress, and of the Bush administration. I feel like that's the role of journalists in a democratic society, is to hold those in power accountable. And, and whether it's the, the donkey or the elephant is irrelevant to me as a journalist. And I think if you, you would find, if you go back and you look at my reporting over the past decade, that I've, I've been the same journalist under Bill Clinton as I am under George Bush. Now, I want to, uh, I want to begin uh, by saying that I've, I've traveled around the country for really the past two months. Um, most recently, I was down in Illinois, and I went out to Joe Davies County, where Blackwater just uh, set up a new facility they're calling Blackwater North. And I also was out in Potrero, California, a tiny little town just outside of San Diego. And, uh, and, and Blackwater thought they would just go and, and open up a, a camp there called Blackwater West, but a funny thing happened on the way to getting all the paperwork worked out. There was an indigenous uprising from Little Potrero, population 850. About half the registered voters in that community have signed a petition against the company, and people have gone to the public hearings wearing Stop Blackwater t-shirts. And you know, I went out there to the site, and it's, it's 824 acres of land in this sort of pristine valley just miles from the U.S.-Mexico border. So you've got Potrero, uh, where, where Blackwater certainly is having an impact inside of the United States, Joe Davies County, and then, well, of course, the roots of Blackwater's founder are ultimately here in your community of Holland. I wanted to, to begin this afternoon by, uh, I, I promise you I'm not going to read sections of the book. I didn't write a children's book. I'm not going to try to regale you with uh, stories of magicians, etc. I wanted to uh, start, though, by reading a part of the book that uh, describes what was perhaps the most famous incident involving what are now referred to as private contractors uh, in Iraq. And it's, it's, it's a strange term, private contractor. I have a friend who's in construction, and he said he takes great offense at the application of that term to armed private soldiers operating in a war zone. Uh, but for the sake of discussion, we'll use the, the, the term private contractors. And this incident happened on uh, the morning of March 31st, 2004, in the Iraqi city of Fallujah. It's a city that I've been to a, a number of times uh, in my travels to Iraq. In fact, I actually camped out in the desert just outside of Fallujah in the summer of 2002, something that would be unthinkable today. When the four Americans rolled into Fallujah in their two Piero Jeeps, the Iraqi Mujahideen in the city of mosques were waiting for them. 
The main drag that cuts through the city is lined with restaurants, cafes, and souks, and on ordinary days, throngs of people mill around. But early that morning, a small group of masked men had detonated an explosive device, clearing the streets and causing shopkeepers to shutter their stores. From the moment the convoy of Americans entered the city limits, the men stood out, driving vehicles known widely in Iraq as bullet magnets, sporting wraparound sunglasses and Tom Cruise haircuts. Shortly after they entered Fallujah, the jeeps began to slow. To their right were shops and markets, to the left open space. They'd hit some sort of a roadblock. As the vehicles came to a standstill, a grenade was hurled at the rear jeep, quickly followed by the rip of machine gun fire. Bullets tore through the side of the rear Piero like salt through ice, fatally wounding the two men inside. As the blood gushed from them, masked gunmen moved in on the vehicles, unloaded cartridges of ammo, and pounded their way through the windshield. Chants of Allah Akbar, God is great, filled the air. Soon, more than a dozen young men who'd been hanging out in front of a local kebab house joined in the frenzy. By the time the rear jeep was shot up, the Americans in the lead vehicle realized that an ambush was underway. They tried to flee or to return to help their wounded comrades, but it was too late. The crowd quickly swelled to more than 300 people as the original attackers faded into the side streets of Fallujah. The jeeps were soon engulfed in flames. The scorched bodies of the Americans were pulled out, and men and boys literally ripped them apart limb from limb. In front of the TV cameras, a young man held a small sign emblazoned with a skull and crossbones that declared in English, Fallujah is the graveyard of the Americans. The mob hung the charred, lifeless remains of the men from a bridge over the Euphrates River, where they would remain for hours, forming an eerily iconic image that was seen on television screens throughout the world. Thousands of miles away in Washington, D.C., President Bush was on the campaign trail, speaking at a fundraiser dinner. This collection of killers is trying to shake our will, the president told his supporters. America will never be intimidated by thugs and assassins. We're aggressively striking the terrorists in Iraq. We will defeat them there so we do not have to face them in our own country. The next morning, Americans woke up to the news of the gruesome killings. Iraqi mob mutilates four American civilians, was a typical newspaper headline. Somalia was frequently invoked, referring to the incident in 1993, when rebels in Mogadishu shot down two Black Hawk helicopters, killed 18 U.S. soldiers, dragged some of them through the streets, prompting the Clinton administration to withdraw forces. But unlike Somalia, the men killed at Fallujah were not members of the U.S. military, at least not on active duty, nor were they civilians, as many news outlets reported. They were highly trained private soldiers sent to Iraq by a secretive mercenary company based in the wilderness of North Carolina. Its name is Blackwater USA. I think for most people in this country, it was the first that they'd ever heard of private soldiers operating in a US war zone. Most people had heard of Halliburton, uh, the, the large war contractor, primarily because of its relationship with Vice President Dick Cheney, who had once headed the company. And then under the Bush administration, Halliburton won incredibly lucrative contracts. But this phenomenon of having four private soldiers ambushed in a city was something that I think caught a lot of people's attention. I've gotten to know the families of those four men who were working for Blackwater when they were killed in Fallujah over these years, and they've let me into their lives and shared with me some of their personal stories. You know, Katie Halvinston, her son Scott Halvinston was one of those guys strung up from the bridge. He was the youngest person ever to complete the elite uh, Navy SEAL BUDS training program. He had trained Demi Moore for her role in the uh, movie G.I. Jane about the Navy SEALs. He hadn't even been in Iraq one week before he found himself in the middle of what was arguably the most dangerous city in the world. When that ambush happened, Katie Halvinston was in her home office in Leesburg, Florida. And like so many tens of thousands of American families, she would keep the news on in the background because she had a loved one deployed in Iraq, and she was paying attention to what was happening in that country. And then a report came on on CNN that civilian contractors have been ambushed and killed. So she went over and she turns up the volume on the TV. And Katie Halvinston actually watched her son's charred torso hanging from a bridge. And it didn't even occur to her that it could be her son because my Scotty's not a civilian. He's not a contractor. My Scotty is a Navy SEAL. So it gives you a sense of how some of the families of these guys view that term of civilian contractor. So Katie Halvinston turns off the TV and says, 
It's getting too awful over there now. They're even killing civilians. It didn't even occur to her that it was her son. Then her, her other son, Jason, calls her up and says, Ma, did you hear the news? It was, they were Blackwater guys that were killed in Fallujah. And her heart sinks, and she begins calling the company. And Blackwater officials told her, we put out a reverse 911 to our men in the field in Iraq. And only about half of them have reported back, and Scott isn't among them at this point. And so she kept calling back and calling back, and eventually it was confirmed uh, that her son Scott was among the four Blackwater men who had been ambushed and killed at Fallujah. Katie Halvenston and the widows of those men and the other mothers and fathers and children began a process of trying to understand what had happened to their loved ones in Fallujah, how they ended up in that city. Katie Halvenston says she thought that her son was going over to Iraq to protect Paul Bremer, the U.S. ambassador. She didn't even, hadn't even heard of Fallujah. And then she finds out that what they were doing that day was escorting empty flatbed trucks on a mission to go pick up kitchen equipment on one side of Fallujah and bring it back to the other side of Fallujah. That was a, a process that would take her all through the maze of this labyrinth of private war contractors. And I'm going to get back to that in a moment. Now, Blackwater is one of about 180 private military firms that provide armed services on the ground in Iraq right now. There's over 180 of them. Uh, most Americans believe that we have 145,000 US troops on the ground in Iraq. Maybe it's a bit higher than that with the recent surge that's being implemented. But let's just say there's 145,000 US troops on the ground. What's almost never mentioned in the reporting on the war, in, in the, the dialogue, dialogue or discourse on the war, war is, is that, that we have at least 126,000 private personnel deployed alongside the official armed forces. That effectively doubles the size of the US occupation force in Iraq through the use of the private sector. Now of those 126,000, we have to admit at this point, no one from the US military or any entity of the federal government has ever been able to give an accurate tally of the number of so-called contractors on the US government payroll operating in Iraq, not to mention those in the private sector. I actually think the number could be significantly higher, but 126,000 is the rough estimate that's given by the military. Of those tens of thousands of contractors, many of them do uh, services that have nothing to do with, with being armed. They work for companies like KBR, which is the largest war contractor, or Fleur, and they do jobs that were traditionally the job of the US military. They cook the food for the troops. They do the laundry for the troops. They drive the trucks uh, around Iraq. But tens of thousands of them are armed private soldiers, some of whom are making more money than the Secretary of Defense or the commanding generals on the ground. Uh, Blackwater is the elite bodyguard service for the US occupation. This is a company that is at the vanguard of an offensive war in Iraq. It's Blackwater that protects the US ambassador in Iraq, not the US military. That's been Blackwater's arrangement from the very beginning. I want to talk a little bit about uh, how this company started, who the people are that run it. Uh, but first, I, I want to I say something in general about this system. If you're a US soldier and you murder someone in Iraq, you can be court-martialed. We've had 64 courts martial of active duty troops on murder-related charges alone in Iraq. We've had tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands, of individual private personnel go in and out of Iraq since March of 2003. A grand total of two, two, have been prosecuted for any crimes or violations. Neither of them were an armed contractor, and neither was accused of a crime against an Iraqi. One was a KBR employee who was alleged to have stabbed a coworker. The other was a man who pled guilty to possession of child pornography images on his computer at Abu Ghraib prison. That is the extent of the rule of law being applied to this private force that rivals the size of the US military in Iraq. It's like the Wild West over there with these contractors. And either we have thousands of Boy Scouts running around as armed contractors in Iraq, or something is fundamentally wrong with the system. Blackwater is a company that barely existed a decade ago. Uh, it was little more than 5,000 acres of empty land on the Great Dismal Swamp of North Carolina, the vision of a handful of men and the private 
personal fortune of Eric Prince, founder of the company. Since then, it's risen out of the rubble of uh, the war on terror, the occupation of Iraq, to become one of the most powerful private actors in that global war. Right now, since June of 2004, Blackwater has been awarded three quarters of a billion dollars just in State Department contracts. That doesn't include the work that Blackwater has done for the U.S. military, for intelligence agencies, for state, local, and federal law enforcement, for other private companies. That's just one contractual arrangement with one entity of the government, three quarters of a billion dollars. Now, Blackwater, the founder of Blackwater, Eric Prince, I feel a bit strange talking uh, in Holland about the history of, of Eric Prince, because I'm sure many of you uh, know a lot about this family uh, and know a lot about what the Prince family has meant to the community of Holland. And some of you may view them in a positive way. Some of you may have a critical way of looking at them. I'll share with you a bit about what we covered of the Prince family in, in the book. Eric Prince's father, Edgar Prince, as you know, built up this uh, company called Prince Manufacturing that serviced the auto industry. And the invention outside of Holland, perhaps within Holland, that the company is best known for is the now ubiquitous lighted sun visor pull down the visor in your car and it lights up, you have a bit of Blackwater's history uh, right, riding around in your vehicle with you. Uh, the company also had some inventions that, uh, according to Eric Prince, didn't work out so well, like a, a ham deboning machine and a lighted sock drawer. Uh, so, so young Eric Prince grows up in this household where his father was uh, perhaps the most influential citizen of Holland, uh, pouring millions of dollars into building up the infrastructure of the city, funding educational institutions, but perhaps more important than that to Eric Prince's future was that he watched his father use his business as a cash generating engine to fuel and fund the rise, not only of the Republican revolution of the 90s, uh, but also of several of the key groups that make up the core of what is now called the radical religious right in this country. So it was Edgar Prince who gave the seed money to Gary Bauer to start the Family Research Council. Gary Bauer is often a Republican candidate for president, uh, very far to the right, as far as, as he can get. Uh, Gary Bauer was also one of the original signers of the Project for a New American Century, the neoconservative agenda that was adopted by the Bush White House. The family was very close and gave substantial support to James Dobson and his focus on the Family Prayer Warrior Network. Those two groups, are now two of the five most powerful and influential religious right organizations in this country with an extraordinary amount of influence over U.S. domestic and foreign policy. Uh, Eric Prince's sister Betsy, uh, of course, married Dick DeVos. And, uh, and together these families merged in the kind of marriage that was commonplace in the monarchies of old Europe. And behind the scenes, they formed this formidable uh, support mechanism that would give rise to the very political figures that would make Blackwater's success a reality through the policies that they enacted, all the way up to the president himself, who, who received significant funding uh, from various members of the Prince family. Eric was a early intern in uh, George H.W. Bush's White House, and uh, he complained that it wasn't conservative enough for him on gay issues, on the budget, on the environment. He also, uh, he's claimed to be a have been a defense analyst for Republican Congressman Dana Rohrabacher of California. Well, when we talked to Dana Rohrabacher's office, they said, no, he was an unpaid intern. Uh, but, but Prince has listed that on his biography, uh, that he was a defense analyst for Rohrabacher. Rohrabacher was an advisor to Ronald Reagan, uh, one of Reagan's top speechwriters. And when he was elected to Congress, uh, the US was supporting uh, the Mujahideen in Afghanistan to defeat the Soviet invasion of that country. And Rohrabacher, in that period after being elected to Congress and beginning his term, actually ran over to Afghanistan to join the Mujahideen in their fight. So these were the, 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 the people that peppered the landscape of young Eric Prince's uh, upbringing. He also was an early intern at the Family Research Council. In fact, when Edgar Prince passed away in 1995, both James Dobson and Gary Bauer uh, delivered glowing eulogies uh, of, of Edgar Prince. Uh, the Prince family uh, gave about a half a million dollars. Edgar Prince, Elsa Prince, and her current husband gave about a half a million dollars in, identifi in identifiable uh, federal campaign contributions. Uh, Eric Prince, his first wife and his current wife, gave about 
uh, $250,000 in uh, identifiable campaign contributions. That doesn't count the enormous amount of money that these families and various family members poured into the infrastructure of the religious right. Eric Prince's dream had been to be in the U.S. military, and he en enrolled in the uh, Navy SEALs, and he had deployments uh, in the 90s in Bosnia, Haiti, uh, the Mediterranean, but in 95, tragedy struck the family, and his, his father died suddenly of a, of a heart attack uh, in an elevator. And um, Eric Prince comes back to Holland to help the family sort through what to do about the business, and ultimately through deliberation, they decide to sell Prince Manufacturing for $1.3 billion in cash uh, to Johnson Controls, I believe it was. Uh, and, and after the sale of that, Prince ultimately, Eric Prince ultimately decided to leave active duty with the Navy SEALs. I believe he stayed in the reserves until 2006, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he then leaves Michigan and goes out to the East Coast and begins the process of building up what would become Blackwater. He got together with a team of other guys from the Special Forces community and they envisioned a sort of gap in the cutbacks on the military spending, a gap in training of, uh, of military forces and law enforcement. And so the original vision of Blackwater was sort of twofold. It was to be a sportsman's paradise where people, gun enthusiasts, could come and fire off their weapons, but also they intended to take advantage of what they saw as the coming uh, acceleration of, of, of government outsourcing of security and firearms related training. Blackwater was incorporated in late 1996 and the original name of the company was Blackwater Lodge and Training Center. And in 97, it was a quiet year as they built up the, the company. In 98, they had their grand opening, and there were two special guests of, from the U.S. Congress that came to the grand opening. One, of course, was Dana Rohrabacher, who Prince had interned for, and then the other was Representative John Doolittle, who's another very conservative uh, California Republican who right now is immersed in all sorts of scandals of his own. Uh, so these two men were there, and the re their reason for being at the grand opening was that they were portrayed as staunch defenders of the Second Amendment. Blackwater opens for business in 98, and then in 99, the first of what would be almost annual incidents that would bring business to Blackwater occurred. In 99, it was the shootings at Columbine. Blackwater responded to those shootings by erecting a mock high school on their compound near the Great Dismal Swamp of North Carolina. This mock high school was called Are You Ready High? And they invited law enforcement agents from around the country to come and train in how to face down against the violent youth of America's schools. The next year, it was the bombing of the USS Cole off the coast of Yemen. I'm sure many of you remember that. It was portrayed as one of the deadliest peacetime attacks against a US vessel. A number of sailors were killed uh, in that attack. The Navy responded by giving Blackwater a $35 million contract to train sailors in how to defend their ships and vessels against such attacks. But the real serious money for Blackwater uh, wouldn't start rolling in until, oh, well, what I should say is this. It was under the Clinton administration when Blackwater was given its uh, federal vending license with the General Services Administration. One former CIA operative that we talked to for the book uh, said it was like, it's like the Walmart of government shopping. You know, once you have that permission slip, you can market your goods and services to any entity of the federal government. So it was Clinton who actually, under the Clinton administration, where Blackwater was actually made an official member of the federal vending club. Uh, and the real money for the company wouldn't start rolling in until 9-11. Now, Eric Prince is not a man who's done many interviews uh, that I've been able to, uh, to track down. He did do a, an email interview with the Virginian Pilot newspaper, which is right in Blackwater's backyard last summer. Uh, he recently wrote a, an op-ed piece uh, for the Grand Rapids Press newspaper that some of you, uh, some of you may have seen, and I would encourage you to, to take a look at that and, and, and compare notes on what you think of it. Um, and, and, uh, but he did do at least one television interview. And uh, you might be able to guess what network Eric Prince went to after 9-11. He, go, he goes to Fox News and he's on, uh, you might be able to guess the program, the O'Reilly Factor. And, and he was brought on as an analyst to talk about the federal air marshal program. If you remember, this was a, a major discussion in this country after 9-11. Should we have armed air marshals? Should we have them on every flight? How widely should this program be used? Should pilots be trained? So Prince was brought on to sort of talk about that issue. And, and he said something, though, that was very interesting. He said that he, had, he was starting to get a little cynical about how seriously people took the business of security and training. And he said, the, the phone's ringing off the hook now. Well, one of the early calls that either came into Blackwater or from Blackwater involved the Central Intelligence Agency. We still haven't been able to determine who called who on this issue. 
But what we do know is this, that Blackwater was contracted by the Central Intelligence Agency uh, to send a small team of, of Special Forces operators inside of Afghanistan in the early stages of operations there. Eric Prince himself went over with that Blackwater team and spent at least a couple of weeks inside of Afghanistan. To my knowledge and from my research, that was the first time that we saw Blackwater crossing over from being a sportsman's paradise and a training facility to providing uh, armed uh, uh, private soldiers for hire uh, to the U.S. government and, and other entities. But the serious ca uh, uh, government contracting for Blackwater internationally uh, would come when U.S. tanks rolled into Baghdad, when the Bush administration ordered the invasion of Iraq. Uh, during the 1991 Gulf War, the ratio of private contractors and soldiers was about one contractor to every 60 soldiers. The Bush administration took power with the most radical privatization agenda in the history of our country. Cheney and Rumsfeld in particular were intent on shaving that ratio down to the almost one-to-one -one ratio that we find ourselves uh, uh, watching unfold in Iraq today. Uh, and when Paul Bremer was sent in as the Bush administration's envoy uh, to Iraq uh, with, with what I think was a pretty clear directive to destroy the Iraqi economy and blank the country so it could be rebuilt in the kind of neoconservative agenda, it wasn't the U.S. military that would be tasked with keeping Paul Bremer alive. Uh, a $27 million no-bid contract was awarded to a private company, and that company was Blackwater USA. And that would begin the role of Blackwater being at the vanguard of the occupation of Iraq. And as Paul Bremer traveled across the country, he was implementing disastrous Bush administration policies. We now have a situation where we know that almost 3,400 uh, men and women serving in the U.S. military have been killed in Iraq. Uh, over 25,000 have been wounded. Now, I think that's a very low number, but that's the official number, about 25,000 wounded. Uh, and if we want to know how we got to a point where 3,400 U.S. soldiers have been killed in Iraq and 25,000 wounded, we need to go back and look at the policies that were implemented on the ground. One of the great disasters of the occupation, I mean, if we can step away from the debate for a moment about the invasion and occupation of Iraq and recognize that it was on, if we look at the decisions that were made on the ground, they would, provide, they would prove disastrous uh, for, the, for the U.S. military. Uh, Paul Bremer implemented something called debathification. The Bush administration was intent on comparing Saddam and Hitler, denazification, debathification. And, and, and under debathification, it, it may sound to you as though you're just taking a few of Saddam's henchmen and removing them from power so that they can stop repressing people. But in fact, what debathification meant was that hundreds of thousands of Iraqi workers were summarily fired because of some affiliation with the Ba'ath Party. I had spent uh, five years going in and out of Iraq uh, when Saddam Hussein was president. And there were so many people who simply signed a piece of paper that said, I support the Ba'ath Party so they could keep their job as a school teacher or a worker in the Ministry of Education or the Ministry of Water. Uh, and, and, and it was no dedication to Saddam, it was a survival mechanism. And so anyone who was proved to have a link to the Ba'ath Party was summarily fired. Now, among those hundreds of thousands of workers, there were the teachers, the doctors, the nurses, the people who worked in the various civilian ministries, but there were also 250,000 armed Iraqi soldiers who stopped getting paid. They marched on the green zone. The commanders of, of, of some of these Iraqi divisions marched on the green zone and said the Americans are committing suicide by firing all of these soldiers. They will join the ranks of the resistance. Indeed, we quote one U.S. official in the book as saying that it was the day we made a quarter of a million armed enemies in Iraq. Many of those men joined the ranks of the resistance, and you can see a direct connection between the uptick in violence against U.S. forces and the decision to fire a quarter of a million Iraqi soldiers. Bremer was in the, the country for a year. Now imagine if the U.S. military was guarding Paul Bremer and Bremer gets killed. Well, there'd be an investigation. Maybe in, in case of extraordinary misconduct on the part of soldiers, there would be some kind of a court-martial, but ultimately it wouldn't go anywhere and the next ambassador would just hit town. But if a private company is guarding the most hated man in Iraq, a man who Iraqis started to refer to as little Saddam or Saddam after Saddam. If a private company loses that man, it could wipe out their business. And the very fact that Blackwater kept Paul Bremer alive for a year, the company is used now as a sort of marketing tool to win other business. If you go to the Blackwater Security Consulting website, you'll see Paul Bremer's face with his Blackwater guards around him, Tony Blair, Colin Powell. The message is, is clear. If we can keep the most hated man in the most dangerous country alive for a year, 
we can do wonders for your business or your government. And the fact that, 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 that Blackwater was guarding him showed this dedication uh, of, of Paul Bremer and the administration to the almighty powers of the free market. They literally placed his life in the hands of the free market. Blackwater's kept alive every ambassador since, and, and, and through that process has gained this reputation as the, this elite mercenary company, this elite private security force. Uh, when Bremer was leaving Iraq in June of 2004, he issued an edict the day before he flew out of the country, known as Order 17. It granted sweeping immunity to all contractors in Iraq, saying that they could not be prosecuted or charged under Iraqi law. That meant that literally, a contractor could walk up to an Iraqi, shoot them in the head, and there was nothing that an Iraqi court could do. And that was issued as Bremer was handing over sovereignty to Iraq. That's a strange definition of sovereignty, to defang the judicial system of a country you've just now declared to be a sovereign nation. It was his parting thank you gift to that shadow army of contractors in the country. Now this Fallujah ambush that I talked about at the beginning, that happened toward the end of Bremer's tenure in the country. And at the time uh, that this happened, the U.S. Marine commanders on the ground had determined that they weren't going to go in and try to take Fallujah by force, that they felt that the only way to deal with Fallujah was through what the Marines referred to as a hearts and minds approach. Once those four Blackwater men were killed, the administration put a siege of the city on the fast track. U.S. forces surrounded the city and pummeled it for days. 37,000 airstrikes carried out, hundreds of people killed, thousands displaced from their homes, U.S. soldiers being killed. It was a massacre that played out in front of the television screens throughout the world, but not so much in this country, because most of the coverage coming from Fallujah for the U.S. market was from embedded correspondence. Most of the rest of the world saw the footage that was being provided from the unembedded journalists inside of the city, and so the world realized that there were women and children who were suffering tremendously in this siege of the city of Fallujah, and that it wasn't simply Saddam loyalists and U.S. forces battling it out. At one point, uh, the U.S. commanders made a condition for a ceasefire against Fallujah that Al Jazeera reporters leave the city. And ultimately, Al Jazeera realized they had the only camera with a live feed inside of Fallujah, and the journalists felt that it would have been a great crime for them to leave the city because they felt that no one would have been there to document what was happening. Well, while, while, while this played out, the UN Special uh, Rapporteur on Iraq, uh, Lakhtar Brahimi, referred to it on US television as a collective punishment of the people of Fallujah. And that response attack, that revenge attack, resulted in the Marines graffitiing the bridge that the men had been hung from that said, this is for the Americans of Blackwater. They wrote in permanent marker on the bridge. That inflamed the Iraqi resistance, that siege of Fallujah, and it, it sparked this escalation of attacks against the US and brought the prospect of a national uprising into clear focus. While all of this was playing out, Blackwater executives kick into high gear back in Washington. Blackwater, on April 1st, 2004, 24 hours after the ambush, hires the Alexander Strategy Group, one of the most powerful Republican lobbying firms in the country at the time. Alexander Strategy was founded and staffed by former senior staffers of then House Majority Leader Tom DeLay, the hammer, the man who was running the Congress, one of the most powerful political figures at the time uh, in this country. Alexander Strategy Group was a jewel of his K Street project. Within days of hiring Alexander Strategy Group, Eric Prince and other Blackwater executives find themselves in a series of face-to-face -face meetings with the men who literally were running both houses of Congress and oversaw the congressional involvement in the business of warfare. March 31st, 2004, four Blackwater operatives killed in Fallujah, Iraq. April 1st, 2004, Alexander Strategy Group hired June 2004, Blackwater awarded a $320 million contract with the U.S. State Department to provide diplomatic security services. This is a company, I remind you, that didn't exist a decade ago, and it's now risen to become this incredible power player. Some of the other forces at play here among the executives at Blackwater are people drawn from the highest levels of military intelligence and government in this country. Perhaps the second most important figure uh, at Blackwater is a man named Jay Kofer Black. He's, he's, a, he's been the vice chairman of Blackwater. He was recently hired by Mitt Romney to be his top advisor on counterterrorism. 
Kofor Black is a 30-year veteran of the Central Intelligence Agency. He's one of the most famous spies in U.S. history, the man credited with catching Carlos the Jackal. He himself was marked for death by Osama bin Laden in Khartoum, Sudan in the 1990s. On 9-11, Kofor Black was the head. And as I'm telling you the story of who this man is, remember he is now a major power player at Blackwater USA. Kofor Black on 9-11 was head of the Central Intelligence Agency's Counterterrorism Center, the man tasked with the hunt for Osama bin Laden. On September 13th, he's sitting in the White House Situation Room briefing President Bush, throwing papers on the ground as he's describing how they're going to insert special forces teams into Afghanistan. And he says, when we're through with them, they're going to have flies crawling across their eyeballs. He goes over to Moscow with Deputy Secretary of State Dick Armitage. They meet with Russian officials. The Russians start warning them about the Soviet experience in Afghanistan, and Kofor Black shoots back, we're going to put their heads on pikes. He was a man seemingly obsessed with corporal mutilation. In fact, the direct orders he gave to the jawbreaker team that went into Afghanistan were to chop off Osama bin Laden's head, place it in a box on dry ice, and deliver it back to Washington so that Kofor Black could present it to President Bush. The operatives, when they were told by Kofor Black their orders, said, those are crystal clear, Kofor. We can get a cardboard box, but I'm not sure what we're going to do about dry ice, but we'll make it work. Well, obviously, Osama bin Laden was never captured. Kofor Black is a man who stood before the U.S. Congress and said there's a before 9-11 and there's an after 9-11. And after 9-11, the gloves come off. And what did he mean by the gloves come off? Kofor Black was one of the central people involved with some of the most repressive policies of this global war on terror. He was a central figure in the Extraordinary Rendition Program, which is the U.S. government-sanctioned kidnap and torture program, where people are abducted from the streets of cities around the world, zipped up and hooded, sometimes a diaper placed on them, shackled to a plane, and sent to a third country hellhole to be tortured, sometimes while they're read questions provided by U.S. interrogators. In March, it was revealed that Kofor Black was one of the central people in heading up one of Eric Prince's new initiatives, a private intelligence company called Total Intelligence Solutions. The top figures at this company are Kofor Black, Robert Richer, who's the former deputy director of operations at the CIA and also a Blackwater executive, and Enrique Rick Prado, one of the top counterterrorism people at the CIA when, Black, when Kofor Black was there. The man behind this is Eric Prince, and it's the merging of a couple of his entities. Eric Prince also owns a think tank called the Terrorism Research Center, which he acquired some months ago. And it's a merging together of, of, of that and these CIA types that now work at Blackwater. What they're doing is they are privatizing, essentially, their CIA careers. And in the case of, of Kofor Black, I, I, I think it raises so many disturbing questions of if those are the kinds of services that should be marketed to Fortune 500 companies private individuals, those with the money to pay for it. This is a company that's at the cutting edge of asymmetric warfare in the world today. It's one of the most advanced private players in this so-called war on terror. Another uh, major uh, figure at Blackwater is a man named Joseph Schmitz. He's the former Pentagon Inspector General under Donald Rumsfeld. His job was to police the war contractor Bonanza as it went off to the races. Well, he seemingly admired Donald Rumsfeld, and he would walk around with Rumsfeld's 12 principles in his breast pocket and would whip them out and read them to journalists. He once gave a speech about the great wrestling career of Donald Rumsfeld. He was under investigation from Republican Senator Chuck Grassley on a number of fronts, and ultimately Joseph Schmitz resigns and takes up employment at the Prince Group, the parent company of Blackwater, and he remains one of the key people in that operation. Joseph Schmitz, on his Pentagon bio, bio, openly boasted of his membership in the military order of Malta, a Christian militia dating back to the Crusades. Eric Prince himself has served on the board of Christian Freedom International, which is a, a right-wing uh, missionary organization uh, that proclaims openly on their website that they believe that the Bible is the only infallible word of God, despite the fact that they're operating in Muslim countries. And I think we need to ask as a society, this question. We're in the midst of a war that the president has referred to as a crusade. You have a private company headed by a man who is on the board of an organization that proclaims the Bible to be the only infallible word of God. Another senior executive, a member of the military order of Malta. Are these the hearts and minds forces that are going to be deployed on the ground inside of a Muslim country? It raises questions. 
about separation of church and state, about what really is at play here in this war. I want to leave some time to, to, to be able to talk uh, some more with you and answer any questions you might have. But I, I want to say that you know, uh, Eric Prince himself wrote in the, uh, in the Grand Rapids Press, I want to make sure I quote it correctly here. No, that's not even it. Uh, Eric Prince wrote this response to the uh, series of articles that were published in the, in the Grand Rapids Press. And one of the things, I mean, there were a number of things in it that I find quite interesting. Uh, first of all, uh, Eric Prince said that his uh, company only engages in defensive operations. Okay. What, what, could be, what could be a more offensive operation than invading and occupying a country? Blackwater has placed its forces at the vanguard of an offensive, aggressive war of occupation. There is nothing defensive about the occupation of Iraq. This is an offensive war. Mr. Prince, Mr. Prince wrote, clearly the mercenary label is intended to polarize the discussion and craft the most negative image possible of Blackwater. The highest authority on rhetoric, the Oxford English Dictionary, however, defines mercenary as, quote, a professional soldier serving a foreign power, close quote. Blackwater does not now, nor has it ever, provided security services for or on behalf of any other country than the United States of America. All right, let's go. That would have you believe that Blackwater is a company of these patriotic Americans who are nobly serving their country. And indeed, Blackwater has a lot of people who believe themselves to be patriots that are serving their country. Uh, I mean, I've, I've talked to a lot of contractors, I've talked to a lot of contractor families, and I think a lot of people sign up for that because they feel that they can finally make some real money for doing what they were paid very little to do in the military. But this is hardly just Navy SEALs and Army Rangers and Delta Force guys and former law enforcement working for Blackwater. This is a company that has recruited mercenaries from some of the most, uh, uh, some, of the, some countries around the world with some of the most questionable human rights abuses on the planet. Blackwater began in early 2004 deploying Chilean mercenaries to Iraq to work for the company. Now let me tell you, I, I have a chapter in my book, I tracked down Blackwater's Latin American recruiter. He had been a, a, a soldier in Pinochet's military. He told me how he took ads out in the paper for former commandos and other soldiers. He set up camps inside of Chile. He got over a thousand applications. The Chileans came and then he said Blackwater flew down three evaluators to look at his forces and by February, March of 2004, Blackwater was bringing, he says, Chileans up to North Carolina for a few days at their compound and then sending them over to Iraq. 92% of Chile was opposed to the invasion. That nation was a rotating member on the Security Council opposing the invasion of Iraq. We don't have a coalition of willing nations in Iraq. We have a coalition of billing corporations. And what the Bush administration was able to do is use Blackwater to hire up soldiers from a country that opposed the war and deploy them in the war zone. Let's reread Mr. Prince's definition a professional soldier serving a foreign power. Well, they're serving two foreign powers, Blackwater and the, and the United States government. What is Chile's national stake in the invasion and occupation of Iraq? What about Colombia, where Blackwater hired up Colombian mercenaries, paying them $34 a day to operate in Iraq? Blackwater has hired Polish forces, Bulgarian forces. This sounds very much to me like the classic definition of mercenary forces. In fact, it sounds very much to me like Mr. Prince's preferred definition of mercenary forces. This is a subversion of the sovereignty of nations around the world, and it's a subversion of the citizenry in this country. What the radical privatization of war has done is take the citizens of this country out of the equation. You no longer have to depend exclusively on your population to serve in your military and defend the interests of your country. You can just go over to the private sector and be limited in the number of personnel you can hire only by the amount of money you want to spend on them. There's something so inherently anti-democratic about this system. It keeps a draft off the table also. You can go on over to the private sector so that you have the right, Mr. Scahill, to be speaking as you do in this country, as I get emails all the time. Because men like us are over there occupying Iraq, you have the right to speak freely in the United States. But they use the private sector to subvert democratic processes in this country. Representative Marcy Kaptur, who's the longest serving woman in the Congress, when I testified in front of, of Congress last week in front of the House Appropriations Subcommittee on Defense, 
Representative Marcy Kaptur said that she had learned more about this system from the prepared statement that we submitted to her than she has in three years of questioning government and military officials. Now, I don't say that, I don't say that because to, to, to blow my own horn or something like that. My, my point here is this. I re receive phone calls from Congress members and their staffs asking me for information about private companies that are working for the U.S. government. It's a stunning commentary on the state of open government in this country that it's Congress members calling journalists and not the other way around. But the fact is that before I testified, I sat and I watched the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction representative and a representative from the Government Accountability Office repeatedly tell members of Congress who are questioning them that they don't really know how many contractors they are. They don't really know the extent of the money being spent on them. They don't really know where they're deployed in Iraq right now. And you know, I've met a lot of active duty soldiers as I've traveled around the country. And, uh, and, and, and many of these soldiers ask the same question, what message is our country sending us? They're deployed in a war zone, wearing an American flag on their uniform, and they see the guys whiz by with the corporate logo instead. And in some cases, those forces have better weapons, they have better body armor, they have armored vehicles. And then these soldiers, like ones I was just with in Colorado, have Vietnam era flak jackets. Their parents are trying to raise money to buy them real body armor. Uh, this, this, this kid, I almost broke down when I heard him talking about this. He said that, he, that, that when he was in Ramadi, which was one of the most dangerous areas of the country in 2004, and he was there, he said he, he had never been in an armored vehicle, that he was riding around in a Jeep with canvas doors, and that he and his buddies had found some scrap metal that they were bolting onto the side of it, and they were placing sandbags on the floor of their Jeep so that they wouldn't be killed by improvised explosive devices. You know, and he said, I understand what I got into. I signed up for the military because I wanted a college education, and it was my bad roll of the dice that it happened, had to happen at a time when there was an invasion and occupation. But how on earth can they justify me being over there, getting paid barely $30,000 a year, and you've got mercenaries working for private companies making more money than my commanding general? You know, John Murtha said that. How on earth can we, how in the hell do you justify it, was what Murtha said, having private contractors making more than the Secretary of Defense. And these forces, they, they, they look at it and it shatters their morale in, in, in a war that already so many soldiers are against and they're over there trapped in this war zone counting the days until they can come back home. And, and, and there's this crisis that's being created also where some of these guys then begin to envy those private forces. They say, I want to be like them. So you have slang on the ground in Iraq right now for going over to the private sector. They call it going Blackwater. And you know, I got a, an email the other day, actually, at about two in the morning, uh, the, the, I had insomnia before I testified in front of Congress, and an email popped into my inbox from a guy who works as a, he's an Arab American who works as a translator for a special forces team of the U.S. military in Iraq. And I just want to read you a part of, of what he said to me. He said, I've been back in the U.S. for a few months due to an injury I suffered during an IED. Sir, I've seen all kinds of terrible and nasty things in Iraq. I was seriously traumatized there. One thing that I hated more than anything else were the PSD guys, the personal security detail guys, the Blackwater type mercenaries, as we called them there. The entire military hated them. While in Iraq, I would read your articles online and wished I could help you by reporting some of the crap these guys would do, but I was afraid to contact you for obvious reasons. One of the reasons I hated them is we would go into a village and assure the locals that the Americans are there to help. We build trust. We show them we're serious about helping them build a better life and everything is hunky-dory. Then a column of PSD mercenaries escorting a politician would go through and shoot at anyone in their way. The locals don't know the difference between them and the military because they see everyone as an American and we lose all the trust we'd so painstakingly built up over the months. I honestly believe that the presence of these unregulated mercenary forces is one of the leading factors as to why America will never succeed in Iraq. That's from a translator working for a U.S. Special Forces division in Iraq. So outraged are some of the military, contra uh, military commanders by the conduct or misconduct of contractors that at least one of them began just tracking incidents of shooting at civilians himself. Brigadier General Carl Horst, who was the uh, deputy commander of the 3rd Infantry Division, which was responsible for security in and around Baghdad, he started tracking contractor violence over a two-month period. He documented 12 cases of contractors firing at civilians, resulting in six deaths of civilians and three injuries. That's two months. One area, one general with his eyes open. Multiply that across the scene and you see what's happening. Let me tell you what, what, what General Horst said about the private contractors after doing that documentation. These guys run loose in this country and do stupid stuff. There's no authority over them, so you can't come down on them hard when they escalate force. 
they shoot people and someone else has to deal with the aftermath. That's the deputy commander of US forces around Baghdad and the 3rd Infantry Division talking about these private contracts. We need to have days and days and days of congressional hearings on this issue. And what I recommend is that the CEOs of all of these major war contractors that have made so much money off of an escalation of the violence and bloodshed and conflict that they receive subpoenas and that they're called to sit in front of Congress and answer for the money they've spent, the conduct and actions that they've committed in the name of the United States of America with U.S. tax dollars. The, the last thing I'm going to talk about here is this, that of course, as many of you know, uh, Blackwater is, is, uh, is not just operating in Iraq and Afghanistan. The vice president of the company says that they're in uh, nine countries around the world. They don't like to use the term army. You, you tell me what arm contingent has its forces deployed in nine countries around the world and boasts of having 20,000 men to be ready to be deployed at a moment's notice in their own fleet of more than 20 aircraft and landing strips and a 7,000 acre private military base. Uh, but Blackwater also increasingly has its sights set on domestic deployments inside of the U.S. I was in New Orleans right after Hurricane Katrina. And I was, uh, I was there at a time when there was no serious relief effort to speak of. It was a horrifying scene. You know, some of the, the greatest people that came down to New Orleans were U.S. veterans from Vets for Peace. And they organized a, a well-greased machine that was bringing water and food and medicine out to people and taking care of older folks who were stuck in their homes. And it was the Vets for Peace and it was the Cajuns in their boats riding through the streets and trying to rescue people and animals. And I saw a lot of ordinary folks bonding together while they were being systematically neglected. And, and when I was there, there was no National Guard presence to speak of because somehow they were defending New Orleans by being in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I'm standing in the French Quarter talking to two New York City police officers that had come down with the New York Fire Department to help. There were so many firefighters that came down to the hurricane zone and volunteered their labor. And we're standing on this corner and it's sweltering hot and, and this car pulls up, a compact car with no license plates. And these three massive guys get out of the car and they're wearing all khaki black jackets wielding M4 assault rifles, pistol strapped to their leg, and they come up to us and they say to the cops, where are the rest of the Blackwater guys? And, and as though they, they had just asked, asked the police, what time is it? The, the cops, oh, they're just, just and I sort of tuned out for a second when I heard Blackwater, Blackwater. And, and I didn't even hear where the, 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 the cops had told them to go. They get back in their vehicles and their vehicle and drive away. And I said to the cop, Blackwater, you, you mean like the guys in Iraq? They said, oh yeah, they're all over the place down here. And I said, well, I'd, I would like to talk with them. I mean, where, where can I find them? And they said, you can go either way on this street. So I walked deeper into the French Quarter, and I found Blackwater guys on a corner and started talking with them. And we ended up talking for well over an hour, but I'll, I'll shorten down what the, the important parts of the conversation were. I asked them, what, you know, what are you guys doing down here? And they said, we're here to help. Well, who sent you down here? Our boss. So I'm thinking, unless your boss is the president, the governor, the head of the National Guard, or the chief of police, we have a very serious situation here. And I was pressing them on, on, you know, what's your mission down here? And they said, we're here to confront criminals and stop looters. One of them, as I was pressing, oh, who are you working for, finally flashes a gold badge. And he said to me, and this is a quote, I was deputized by the governor of the state of Louisiana. And they added that they could use lethal force if they deemed it necessary. And I hear one guy talking on his cell phone in the background saying to his friend, on the other line, you don't want to come and work for Blackwater down here. They're only paying $350 a day plus a per diem, $350 per day. Uh, one of the guys had just been in Iraq two weeks earlier, and he was complaining that there wasn't enough action in New Orleans. I wonder what he meant by not enough action, someone who had just come from Iraq. And another guy was bragging to me about his explosion-proof BMW that he drives around Hilla in Iraq. Uh, some of them had been in Afghanistan. Some had been bodyguards for John Negroponte. And now here they were on the streets of New Orleans. So at the time, the federal government had denied that they had hired any private security uh, because you realize what the scandal would have been there. There's no National Guard, and so you hire a politically connected mercenary force to deploy on the streets of New Orleans. And as I investigated this, it turns out that in fact Blackwater had been hired by the Department of Homeland Security, Federal Protective Service, to deploy in New Orleans. Kofor Black, the vice chairman of the company, told me that they initially went down there with no contract. They just showed up in New Orleans, and then they got the contract about a week into their deployment. I wonder what, what was going on before that week. So they get hired up. 
Remember the guys on the ground said they, they were making 350 a day plus a per diem? When I got the contracts, Blackwater had billed taxpayers $950 per man per day at a time when welfare mothers were being chastised for their $2,000 debit cards. Blackwater had 600 operatives at one point, stretching from Texas through Mississippi and the Gulf. At one point, they were pulling in $240,000 a day. I forget, I did a report a few months after that that indicated that Blackwater at, at that point had made about $73 million. But then the, the company held a, a Hurricane Katrina fundraiser in November of 2005. Paul Bremer was the keynote speaker. They, they made $138,000 and gave it to the Red Cross. Blackwater was one of over 100 of these kinds of companies that descended on the Gulf to operate there. Blackwater, at least we know, Blackwater was, was largely working for the federal government. We don't know what a lot of these, these armed individuals were doing down there, these private armed individuals. I do know this, though. I encountered Israeli commandos who had been flown in by a wealthy businessman from Texas. These Israeli commandos set up an armed checkpoint on the streets of a U.S. city, of New Orleans, and they were stopping cars and questioning passers-by. They worked for a company called ISI, Instinctive Shooting International. When I talked to them, they tapped on their guns, and one of them said, when the Palestinians see these, it's nothing to them. They're used to it. But when you, when you Americans see it, you get really nervous, and they seem to sort of take some kind of joy in, in, in the idea that they were a startling scene. There were snipers on the roofs of the buildings in this gated compound. I mean, the, the wealthy just brought in their own armies while the poor were suffering without any kind of a relief operation. It's a window into what could happen under this privatization agenda in this country in the event of national emergency and natural disasters. And so now out of that Hurricane Katrina operation, Blackwater started a whole new division of the company for domestic operations, and we see it expanding now. They've hit Joe Davies County, Illinois. Uh, they're going now trying to uh, open up a facility out west uh, in, near San Diego called Blackwater West. And I, I, I think that in closing, what I want to say is that what I think is so crucial right now is, is, is to throw back, to stop in its tracks the secrecy at play with the government. We need oversight. We need transparency. We need the rule of law to apply across the board. We live in these times of incredible of incredible secrecy, where we have a tremendously difficult time overseeing the official work of the government, of law enforcement, the military, the White House, the Congress, the judiciary system. Now you add to that a, a force that rivals in size that of the active duty military on the ground in Iraq, and Congress members say they're being stonewalled in their attempts to get information on those companies. We need to bring down the veil of secrecy that has shrouded the operations of these companies for too long. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I didn't expect to get that in Holland. <laughs>